Welcome to another edition of the Bandwagon Podcast. And um, over the last 40 episodes or so, you've probably kind of picked up a different a, a theme, a sub-theme of my love for the doll and um, the, the whole percussion kind of genre. And I was sitting there the other day and I thought, I think it's time. I think I need to kind of go over that little personal kind of thing that I've got to get out of my system and, and talk to actually doll royalty. So my guest today is the legend, Johnny Kelsey. Thanks for having me, man. No, thank you first. Uh, I know um, I kind of messaged you out of the blue and see if it was possible. And I know you're tight for time as well. So I just want to get that bit out of the way just to show in terms of like how busy and the stuff that you're working on. Can you just tell me a little bit what you're doing right now? Um, right this very second, I'm in the middle of um, writing a piece of music uh, rejigging a piece of music, should I say, um, for the Commonwealth service for the Queen on Sunday. We record it on Sunday. I don't know when it goes out. It might be live. It might be like a couple of days after. But it's like the fourth time we're doing the Commonwealth service for the for the Queen. And it's quite cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that is incredible. So, you know, like you're going from from me to the queen you know I, 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 you know apologies if it's not on that kind of level but like if you got if you if you're looking at your repertoire i was just doing the research last night and i was like going five albums working on a sixth and doing all these kind of, and then you've got uh audience with the royal family international different part, parts of different bands uh, from different genres um honorary degree from leeds college of music I mean, it's not just something that's kind of fallen into place. You've earned the right to to get to that level. Yeah, I appreciate that. I really am Dr. Dahl. They gave me, they gave me a doctorate. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Dahl. Dr. Dahl, yeah, that's me. Um, but no, I'm, I'm honoured and privileged to actually reach this far and just um, stay with my dreams, really, stick with my goals and just kind of like just pursue everything, you know. Um, this is my little sanctuary. Welcome to my studio. Um, it's only a pre-production um, little segment um, that's attached to my home. And um, there's lots of memorabilia and reminders of, of like, well, everything really, of where I've been, instruments I've bought, like on my travels. Um, to the right of me, I have my, my little prayer section. I don't know if you can see that, but. It's like, you know, um, yeah, I can see. Baba Ji Maharaj photo and everything's on that side. And on this side, um, my studio wow. up here, I've got all my tour laminates. I don't know if you can wow. see. Wow. So those the... people listening, in, you could just see just like probably hundreds of different kind of laminates, you know, like <laughs> your work passes that you got, yeah, you know, when you were go. But now everyone's working from remotely and, it, and the majority of them. So like, yeah, still, exactly. Those are them. my work passes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of things that people don't know um, back in the day. And it's, you know what I have to say, Rick, it's nice to get recognised, to get the support finally from up in Bundy, you know, because all my life I've never had it, never. But you've never... My, my music's been called dated, um, like 80s style. No one wants to play it, which is fine. I don't, you know, I just, I'm like a horse with blinkers, you know. I... I did this gig once, right, with Gurdas Mansa. It was amazing. It was just, it wasn't so much about the gig anymore after mm. we had a chat backstage. And it was in Birmingham. It's in, it was in the Dome, like this going back. Mm. And Gurdas Mansa said to me, he goes, I said, Babaji. <laughs> Babaji. Oh, yeah, you would at that time. He goes to Kokabaya. Uh, I said, Hanji Babaji goes, say, Kadevasti. I said, Bas artist look, uh, you know, back in the day, I see tattoo, Vigara, Banale, Fil Mundiani, Miri, Nakal Karli, the fair, uh, Makuch Hor Karlia, the fair, Odi Nakal Karli, Metula, Prasida, Banaya, Odi Nakal Karli. The Agas per Tonu Gita Lagda, Agas Judu Tonu, Maki, Nakal Kitti, Lokane. He goes, get down, knuckle. He goes, uh, I said, you know, when you bought the jacket out and it had the bumble on the mm. the shoulders, you know? The, yeah, yeah. The whole the, outfit was exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. The full. And all these, like, 
people started copying it and just getting that that design done. He goes, Son Medigal. I said, Hanji. He goes, Me rasta apna labya sita. Na me khabe dekra. Na me sache. I just keep going forward. He goes, but kadi kadi, puchhe nu morke dekhi da te mela lagga unda. Is that is that why your first group was called Mela Group? <laughs> it was Mela, yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. It's, it's so funny. And I, I took that on board, maybe not knowing the whole essence of what he actually what he actually put in my hand. Mm. But it's so true. You know, you just on on the odd occasions like this one, I get the chance and the opportunity to look back and see what I've done and I'll go, oh my God, I did all of this. I, I think but every step of the way there was no Asians. Yeah. And I, as much noise as I made, I'm not mm. even I'm not criticizing because I think personally I'm gonna be more famous when I'm dead than I am alive. <laughs> like like no not even joking. My music will mean something after I'm gone, as opposed to people listening to it now. People know it exists, but they don't know the essence. They don't know what it takes to actually make a recording or how much effort it takes. It, it, honestly, you put your guts, heart and soul, all the producers you've spoken to, mm. they spoke about, um, I did this and I did that. And, you know, then we put the dumbi on, then, you know, somebody said, come into the studio, let's do it together, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, great. But they don't tell you the blood and guts and time it takes. The sacrifices you have to make to produce an album is phenomenal. No, but no one talks about it. But all along... Like I said, back in the day, my first album, right? There's yeah. this one track I made. Oh, my God, there's so much I want to tell you. There's one That's track. Right. Um, it's called To Go Mad. I never released it. I've published it. I've published the track. It's registered to me because I, I made it in the studio. I produce it. I kind of mastermind. It's a rhythm track. Mm. Um, it's the most bootleg track in the doll industry, okay? The most bootleg. You know what that means? Yeah, it yeah, means yeah. It means basically everyone plays it. <laughs> no one's allowed to record it or put take the recording put because they'll get done for it. It's yeah, like, it's copyrighted. Um, but I never, I vowed never to release it. I thought, right, you know what, Mondial, you've done this, no problem. Take it, but no one can release it because it belongs to me. One day I might put it on an album, and then everyone will be like, "What the hell?" But I recorded that in nineteen. 94 <laughs> by 97 i was looking for a record deal my album was ready to go i still couldn't find any and i went to i approached the indian labels and they none of them would would do it the proper way proper way being registering the tracks and doing it proper and putting a barcode on the on the actual cd the barcode means everything because that's your publishing yeah and it, get onto that i'll get i'll get onto that <laughs> anyway so my album finally came out in 2001 and i was signed to virgin emi and yeah. it was an off cut it was like shakti records which belonged to virgin emi anyway long story short the album was called big drum small world and um i started recording it like i said in 94 95 finished it in 97 um a lot of it was done in Jasmine Cafe studio up in Birmingham. Yep. Um, I remember like living under and sleeping under the desk, sleeping in the studio for weeks on end and eating cold KFC in the morning. <laughs> it was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the sacrifices, this is what I'm talking about. So, yeah. um, anyway, the last track on the album is called Drummer's Real. It made the film Gangs of New York like Martin Scorsese, yeah. a Hollywood movie. Um, and finally, like, I got invited to the premiere. I was there, I was meeting everyone, met Mr. Scorsese himself. And we were just, and then seeing your name up in on the silver screen. On the credits. At, at the end. You know, it's just amazing. If you go to a premiere, all the people that work, all the riggers, cast, you know, that mean something. As their name comes up at the end, they all cheer. So you, like, got pockets of mm. cheers in different areas of the cinema it's quite amazing and of course there i was as soon as the the big drum small world credit came out all of my entourage we all 
got up and cheered. It was amazing. And people were like loving it. They would laughed. I was the only Indian there, by the way. Do you, do you feel like quite often my relationship with you, and I'm, I, I, this is the second time I've ever spoken to you, but like I felt like I've known you for a long while because of my history with it all and, and, and learning. I mean, I, I'm a rubbish player, so let's just put it that one. However, oh, no, it was, it, no, it was just, it was talking about the kind of mentality of it. So, you know, it's like you, you've also been in, you know, Incredible Hulk, your, your soundtrack's been used there. It's been used, um, you know, for forever or more. I could be totally wrong at this bit, but did you play a Warring Doll by any chance? Asian Dub Foundation. Yes, my old band. That track was the first, I don't know why I, I had to just double check that because when I heard what that- it, What was the track? Warring Doll, Asian Dub Foundation. Warring Dawn, no, I think Warring Dawn came after me. I played on Rebel Warrior, which is like the first yeah, album. Yeah. And um and the community, it was the community music album. Um, and that was that was me, that was my <laughs> recording. But then I got poached and moved on from there um to Transcubble Underground. I think somebody else took over and then Pritpal took over from Ministry. And then I think the Warring Doll, I think that's probably him. Because I was I think that's Pripal. So I did Rebel Warrior. That's my one. Yeah, because I got kind of introduced to this kind of alternative, and I'll say I'll, I'll I'll use that kind of loosely in that way. Because when when I was playing Doll, I was in Doll Blasters back in the like Midlands, and you know with all the all these crew, right? Nice, nice. And, yeah, and then so like, I've said it in previous podcasts, but you know the there was this emphasis of when we were learning from Gritan, uh, Gritan Ma, which was about stamina and all of this kind of bit and very traditional style. But as it was evolving, we, you know, as you said, as Gudas Ma, as, you know, you're turning around and you're looking at all these other routes and you can see people just trailblazing in their own areas. And then we were like, Johnny Kelsey, what door foundation? Who are these? And then, my mate used to own Samson's Palace. And we still does. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there used to be door classes going there. So I used to kind of, after that, used to sneak over and go and have a look at what these guys are, what these guys are doing. Nice. And so when... Like when, a spy, like a spy. Like a spy at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I kind of left that group. From there, I love it. I had, had a few spies in my life. Don't yeah, worry about it. Yeah, yeah. But this is kind of the fascination in terms of, like, the things that you were doing. So the first things first was, like, how you were holding the dilly, how you holding the treble stick. Oh, uh, that's another story, see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, let's get the story out from you first. Because, like, your, your beginnings, you're, you're self-taught. Um, you come from a kind of geek and back. You've got passionate, you've got political, you've got all this kind of stuff in you. And then, <laughs> and then I, see, I see this bit, and I was like, hang on, he's up, the, the dilly's the wrong way. And it was really kind of a, re, like, a massive mind fuck in my head. Yeah, yeah, totally. I get it. Um, so basically, with, with regards to that, um, I was born in the world of like coming into rhythm a little bit late. Um, but although my dad, he, you know, he's quite a high, and my granddad were high, high pillars in the Gurdwara, you know. Yep. I'm talking like Soho Road Gurdwara in Birmingham. Yeah. And um, he still is. My dad, like, he's still like, you know, he's quite high up anyway, let's say. Um, so, yes. In my household, I was complete rebel because I, you know, I didn't academically, I didn't achieve anything at that point. Um, he, like, said I should do Kirtan, so I went to Kirtan class, and you know, double R became my because I was into my passion was rhythm since a very young age, and I was probably about I don't know nine, ten, started playing double R. So you know, double R is like. My my all time sort of like first instrument I ever laid my hands on. By the time I, I mean I was learning, but I wanted four to the floor, and I was learning dindal, you know the classical. So, and I thought to myself, you know what, I actually want to do four to the floor, groove a little bit more. And I, when I got in school, the first opportunity, I picked up these pair of drumsticks, yeah. and drums became my. That became my passion. At home, um, my dad had this regal Italian like furniture, and he had one of those, oh, what are they called? Cigar couches. You know the the leather ones with the with the dimples where the buttons. Yeah, are. yeah, like Chesterfield style. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Chesterfield. That's it. Uh, I used to straddle his Chesterfield couch, yeah, and use these 
ceramic chopsticks as drumsticks, stick on Led Zeppelin, <laughs> stick on a LARP, I played drums to it, stick on Led Zeppelin, I played drums to it. Little did I know at that time, do you know what I was doing? I was actually manifesting. Without me knowing, I was manifesting. And um, basically, by manifesting, I'll, th this is another story I'll come back to. So um, that was my first instrument. At school, I started learning drums. So I started playing drums, holding the sticks. This is called match grip. This is called traditional grip, where they play the... Side, yeah, the marching side. bands kind of thing, yeah. And this is like a combo grip. So you're doing half and half, right? But I used to play match grip like this. So from here, between here and playing double are two different actions altogether. Okay. Mm. But from here, hitting downwards, then suddenly I got doll sticks in my hand. By the time I got doll sticks, I held them like this. I, I got yeah. No one taught me to play like this. Now, of course, back in the day, there was very, very few videos. Very mm. few videos. Um, my diary, he used to play ball, but he'd play it like that. But I never actually got shown, okay, this is how you hold a dilly. I teach like this. I mm. play like this. I get my power and everything like this because I'm basically playing all the time. Anyway, so here's the, here's the connection. Doubler. My na is at the top of my wrist because I'm used to doing this. In my... Do you understand? Yes. Drums hold the sticks like this. There's and... a connection straight away. So basically, that's my striking. Do you see what I mean? Yes. When you play dorluk dol or dolki, the na is at the bottom of your wrist, playing it inwards. Dol, traditional grip. Again, the na is at the bottom of your wrist, here. Yes. My na has always been, been at, at the top. top. Wrist, this way. Yeah. So it was natural for me to kind of bring it inwards and play. Right, I got yeah. I understand <laughs> that people just don't get it. You're holding it wrong. Yeah, I know, but this There's is a reason. I wasn't taught. Yeah. Had I been taught, I think I would have been all right holding it this way. Anyway, that was the connection. So back to the Chesterfield. So um, all that time I was playing music, playing to the, I was actually using that music as my metronome we're talking like early 80s yeah right? yeah yeah so that was my metronome that was my timing i was learning about timing i was learning about placement i had a vision of what the drums looked like anyway years years later um i established myself doubler and doll in Miller group there was when the band they stopped performing um and then after that i started playing with djs and i was the only door player playing with djs and this is another very funny story i actually walked into the wrong wedding once and they wouldn't <laughs> let me go <laughs> <I went to laughs> the... well, is it is it london it or in, in greenford yeah, yeah yeah i went to the wrong hall and there was a wedding going on and i goes is it dj rav so DJ Rav was, he was the guy that booked me. And he goes, yeah. When I got there, I was looking for Rav and he wasn't there. And I went to the DJ, I goes, where's Rav? And he goes, Rav, that's me. I goes, are you DJ Rav? And he goes, no, Rav with an F. And I went, oh, no, no, no. I goes, is Rav here? He goes, no. I goes, I'm at the wrong wedding. And he goes, you got to play. Bruv, honestly, no joke of lie. The bride and the groom were about to cut their cake. It was in the middle of the dance floor. They made them stop. Move the cake out of the way so I could do a slot. I said, I'm at the wrong wedding. They said, no, you can't go. You've got to play. I was like, oh, my God. So I played for ad hoc wedding. They put 50 quid in my hand and I, I legged it to the right one. To I did, I, oh, thank God for that. You went there. Yeah, no, no, I got it. I got it. I made it. But it's just... And then obviously that was that was a little gap anyway. So after that, the band that I joined a lot. And it was weird because that's the music I was playing. I used to play along to. I used to get my double eye out and play along to a lot. Anyway, 
I became their door player for years. When I left the band, I was like, okay, I was on the cusp of leaving. Um, and I didn't burn any bridges. I'm still passionately in love with all of the, all of the guys from a lot, all of them. I'd still help Jenny out on occasions doing his charity work and doing all of that. So anyway, besides, um, so <laughs> let, left that all behind. So basically then I got under the wing of Peter Gabriel. And after that, I didn't look back. I didn't look back at, I did the odd Bhangra gig here and there. I did the odd DJ thing here and there, but honestly, living in that other world, knowing how it's, everything's done prim and proper, walking into a place where you don't even have to carry a drum anymore, where you walk on stage and it's all set up for you, ready to go. Um, it just grew from that, it just grew bigger and bigger. Um, to the point now I've got loads of endorsements, I'm endorsed by GoPro, I'm endorsed by Zildjian, the cymbal company. Mm. Um, I'm endorsed by Remo, the drum heads. Like, um, I'm endorsed by uh, Vic. Vic. Uh, yeah. For the drums and mallets. Um, and Zildjian for the drums and uh, skit, sorry, sticks and mallets. Um, Gibraltar racks. There's so many, uh, like, they just, you shout world tour and they go, take our stuff. Yeah. And just go. All right then. The, Rim, Rimo's, um, Rimo's the one that stands out because that was like the ambassador batter, the the the, the, the you know the skin that you'd use on the door the door bit. But yeah. even even then, like I, I, I'm trying to like come back into like little bits in terms of like kind of your story. But I haven't but, told you the best bit yet. All right, okay, go on then. You go for your best bit, and then I can just tell you with the impact of having black. Are you skins. ready for this? Ready <laughs> yeah, for go this? for it, go on then. So. Years later, I did this gig while I was with another band, Transglobal Underground, and that was my band as well. And we did this amazing performance at Queen Elizabeth Hall. And after the performance, I see this guy with amazing golden locks. And I approach him and I go, I know you, don't I? And he goes, it depends what kind of music, you, <laughs> other music you listen to. I said, well, obviously I listen to world music, but I grew up listening to you. It was Robert Plant Love. from Led Zeppelin. And then, you know, it was a case of, like, Hammy, he was the drummer in Transglobal. He just turned around. We were just joking. But he said, is there any chance of like, doing a support with Led Zepp? Next thing we know, we're doing a, a whole European and Mediterranean tour with Led Zeppelin. That is next level. Supporting them. I, I This is the... Right, now here's the twist. I approached the Indian press. I approached the Indian media. Back then, there wasn't very many. It was ZTV, Bina, Mystery, and, and them lot. Bit of Eastern Eye, maybe? Maybe a bit of Eastern Eye, but I did ask them, but they were mm. too far away. Anyway, besides that. So I asked these guys, and I booked um, VIP tickets, like press tickets, for them to come and film the first four numbers of the set. And we're talking Wembley Arena, packed Wembley Arena. And we did three nights. Man, I had probably about 50 door players on stage with us. For one number with Transglobal, all of Led Zeppelin, they all came out to the wings to come and watch us. They were just going, what the hell? <laughs> Flawed. The Indian people didn't turn up. They didn't come. Nobody came. No one. It's and you know, to this day, I'm telling you now, mm. it, it killed me knowing that I, I never had that support. I never had it. But I was young, I was naive, and it was kind of one of those things where you just go, you know what, I'm just going to do this, job, job, and then let people turn around now and say, why don't you tell us? Why don't you tell us? And that's exactly what happens. Now I do gigs behind Buckingham Palace in her garden. And people go, why didn't you tell us? I go, well, because I didn't think you'd be interested. So I don't tell anyone. Chop job, horse with blinkers, look straight ahead and keep gunning for it. And I keep manifesting. Every day I'm manifesting. So I thank my guru, my Maharaji, for putting me where I am and for making my 
parents proud of who I am, you know, and that's the most rewarding because, you know, obviously my my mum and dad are my everything. They're my temple and my, you know, the reason for my existence, if you mm -hmm. like. So they are my rub, you know, my living rub is my parents. And I'm proud to make them proud, you know. This this challenge of of, of culture and and um, fighting against it and evolving it and taking it to a, to a point, you know, I, I could probably sense a little bit. I'm, I may be using the wrong word in terms of like being a bit bitter. Do you feel in terms of like what how to kind of safeguard the future generations and to like because you know you are an inspiration to many many young uh, young people, young generations taking on this journey. Is there any is there any lessons that you could kind of tell them in terms of doing that? Because the Indian, like let's say the Asian media, for example, is kind of it's moved on a little bit now, and content is everything. Where back then, you know, you could be you could be speaking to kind of an old school bureaucratic or an old regime in terms of doing of, of trying to produce content and put something out. How, how how do you how do you kind of move it forward? What I would tell the youngsters, the next generation, is if you're going to do it. Do it wholeheartedly, but do it properly. Don't do it so somebody else is taking advantage of you. Because, you know, that will happen along the line. That will definitely happen. And it's human nature. If somebody else is doing something and they can see that it's it's a good thing or it's popular at that time, yeah. they'll, they'll, put a, they'll put the same shop as you've got right next door to you and go, we're going to do it as well, but we can do it cheaper than what he's doing it. And I go, carry on, lads, because you know what? You're doing your own version of what I do. Everyone does their own version. They don't do what I do, you know? And it's great. You know, I, I'm not knocking them because they all deserve it. And they're all out there. They're all playing. They're all having a go, and they're fantastic, brilliant. Respect to all of them, really. Um, I don't care if I've been influenced by other people, by other bands. I don't care if I've influenced them. I don't care. All I care about is they're pushing the, the art. They're pushing our culture. That's what matters the most. And that's something that, you know, I've learned from really well-renowned door players. But at the end of the day, you know, even in India, they just give me so much love and respect. And they just go, Johnny Bargy, what you've done for the Dawn in England, we could never do. And I go, listen, I'm just like not even a drop in the ocean. I can't even play half the stuff you guys play. You're amazing. And I'm, I'm honoured to say that I've worked with the guys in, in Punjab, you know, work with these Dawnies that they're just incredible. Lightning speed, man. Lightning. Mm. And they play Dawn like it's like, like Dabla, like Zakir would play Dabla. That's how they play Dawn. Anyway. Um, but they give me so much love and respect. I just can't, I can't fathom, you know, what they see. Uh, I don't see that, you know, because I'm always, I'm always looking forward. So with that in mind, I mean, if people are going to do it, do it properly. Yeah. Do it, do it hundred percent wholeheartedly and make a good go of it. Be the best at what you are be the best human that you could possibly be. And I could kind of, so the first time I ever met you was actually at a wedding. <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I um, I was playing, it was a wedding in the in the Midlands and uh, I was the only doll. I was with Apa Jen at that time. Oh, nice. And, yeah, we were doing, doing it and um, he never told me, but he kept smiling all day and he goes, oh, Johnny Kals, he's going to be here. And I absolutely shit myself. And <laughs> I was like, and I swear <laughs> to God, because <laughs> I was like, because, you know, like, you're dealing with another because you you guys like door foundations was like the other like you're married but this is the secret girlfriend <laughs> you know the one, the one, you know this is the one that everyone looks around oh yeah yeah you know what i mean i don't know what that's like but anyway yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just kind of giving it you know where you, you're married you're, you're married but oh this analogy is dying but basically yeah what i mean like you're gonna i'm gonna that. stop yeah, yeah no I'm all, I'm all, I know. my wife doesn't watch yeah. this anyway so anyway okay. um, yeah. no but you know like from afar you always admire them from afar and then 
you came into this, you came to the world, you came up to, you came up to me, and I just like shook, like shook your hand and all this stuff. And he goes, "Yeah, we're going to do the entrance. Are you right to you play with us?" And, and I was like, uh, "Hang on, I'm not programmed to like this guy in, in some way because I've been scared because the way that I've been, w- the way that we've been taught in terms of like how the skill level, the delicates that you guys knew, were just like unattainable, unreach- unreachable for me at that point. You came in, you did the entrance, but you got, you got me involved." And then, you know, encouraging me. And then you actually gave me a dilly at the end, which I kept, I still have to this day. Stop it. I swear to God, I've got it at my, I've got it, I have my doll at my parents' house. And I was like, this is like, I thought there's levels. And I, and I, you know, when somebody can just change an opinion just like this. And then I was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And that's why, <laughs> honest to God, I've done this pod, I've been doing this podcast and you liked one of my posts in it. Ran downstairs. I go, do you want me? I go, look, Johnny Kelsey, it's Johnny Kelsey, and then uh, she was like looking at me like, what? Just put the fucking washing machine on here. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I, mean? I was like, okay, so, but but I was like, I was like, because it was just the, you know, at that time, I think it's hard. I've I've tried to explain it before, but on my my road, there was eight dollies. The the doll was so fashionable. You guys had black skins. Then you had um, straightened dolls. You know, everything that was kind of like culturally between London and Midlands, it was, you know, it was really good for the art. Everyone was pushing each other. You had the competition. Exactly, yeah. Did, yeah. You, did you ever feel that from, from a London point of view? There was all, you know, interestingly, when I was with the LARP, yeah, we'd always like leave for Birmingham in the morning. All the Birmingham bands would leave for London. <laughs> we'd like... You just cross over. Yeah. yeah, crossover. We'd pass each other. And then... You know, Leicester Forest is the only uh, service station that you can cross over the bridge, yeah? Yep. And once we we kind of, we met the up lot <laughs> at Leicester Forest. They were going to London. We're going like Birmingham. Birmingham. Well, no, we weren't going to Birmingham. We were going to Bradford. Right. So funny. But, you know, it's, it's weird how that all happened but we never had any animosity with the bands yeah we'd stand there like i remember doing this one at maestro in bradford and it was a gig and it was all the bands that started with a azad and amika yeah it was all like i was like this is like the a team yeah <laughs> it's the a bands so, so I'm, 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 I'm coming from more in terms of like from you at the head figurehead of door foundation and like did you feel it in terms of from like pushing your students to get to a certain level or were you just so far down your own road and in terms of that you didn't really need to look back or you were just doing completely different styles i mean i can say that you know it wasn't about me it was all about it was all it was always about the students but somebody had to be there to be the mascot I call myself a mascot mm. um, to kind of guide them. Um, I wouldn't say I was, a, I never saw myself as like, oh, you're the leader or you're the, I saw myself more sort of, you know, um, through experiences, you understand that you're responsible for these kids. I never treated my class like a social club. I never, never treated it like that. Some classes, they do treat it like a social club. They'll stop playing door, they'll get in the phones and they'll go outside and take a phone call nowadays and stuff. I don't tolerate any of that because parents have left their kids there in your responsibility. Mm. I'm the only, I'm the only known person with a child protection policy, with a DBS check, like every every six months, 12 months, I get a DBS. That's law. If you're teaching kids on your own and you're going to be on your own in a room with a child, you need to be checked by the police. Mm. It's law in this country. Mm. Anyway, in Upper they don't, they don't care about that. They don't care about a child protection policy. They don't care. They just dump their kids. Off you go. <laughs> See you at nine o'clock. And sometimes they're late. <laughs> you just go. But I never leave them. I mm. stayed. I stay there. And I would speak to the parent and go, listen, I will always stay here. No problem. But half past nine in the evening, I've got 
I've got home to go to too. <laughs> Please. Yeah, yeah. Try yeah, and be on time. If yeah. you don't mind. Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. And that's happened on occasions. But I would rather teach five really good door players that don't mind paying and don't mind learning what and and just do it wholeheartedly as opposed to having a team of 20 that just do it like I'm here for the birds or I'm here for this or I want to get on the phone and speak to my mates or I just want to have a drink up and then go on stage and bruv do the job in hand put your drum away get hammered I don't care but just be clear when you're when you're actually gigging and use the adrenaline as a buzz as opposed to using a bit of Dutch courage but that's always been you know my sort of take on it I mean you know the odd with my band, like the Gore, they'll come on and they'll have like one or two beers. They're very controlled and they'll just be totally on it. Um, and then afterwards, they'll just get, you know, they'll lay into the rider. A rider, incidentally, <laughs> is like... <laughs> it's, it's, it's the... Uh, let's just say it's the uh, the requirements of the to decorate the room with the food and alcohol and anything else. Yeah, it's basically um, our snacks, foods, um, energy drinks, obviously the alcohol, but, you know, we don't attack the alcohol like we've never seen it, you know. Um, there's one amazing story I'll always remember. Um, I was playing with a LARP, and I think it was either night in or it's one of those. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there was a DJ as well. They had a DJ as well. So... Basically, because they had a DJ, they made us make a have a break, and the DJ took over and played some other tunes. Anyway, during the break, I went to the gents because I needed to go for a wee, yeah. and the urinals were there, and I walked in to see a like a man, a child, empty urinal, empty urinal. I went to the one on the end because I didn't really want to. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went on the end. So, and when I looked down, right at the other one, at the one in between, the empty one, somebody had puked in it. Someone had puked in the urinal, and the kid. This is quite amazing. The kid looked at it and he looked at his dad. Yeah, and he goes, "Daddy, Arkia." His dad looked over like that, and he goes, "But and lal chicken there." I looked over at the dad and I went, that is the best answer you could ever give your son. Best. Lalji. Jitte mufdi mildina shirab. Ote daf daf kini pi da hunda. Just be sent, just take. Yeah, be sensible. It's Limited not gonna... the means. But what a wicked answer. Wicked answer. I was like, that is the I, I, to this day I carry it with me to this day, because one thing you should never do is large. Large is just is greed. By the way, for the ones that don't know what it means, greed. I'm always about humanity. I'm always about um, just being on point and living for the moment. Because certain things in my life that have happened that have made me look at life in a different way. Losing my mum when I was 22, that was one of the things that taught me how fragile and how much we take tomorrow for granted. So from that day, I wake up and I smile every day in the morning that I get another chance to make somebody else's day. Yeah, I mean, definitely as a young kid, and when I saw you that first time, you know, it made me smile, and then when I saw you like that bit, it made, it took me back. Then when I first when I first when I when I met you, this is only the third time I met you. It, it, You've blown way. my mind by saying <laughs> you still got the dilly that I gave yeah, you. Yeah, man, that's honestly, completely yeah. honestly, Rick. I, I'm yeah. I'm floored. I really yeah. am. I still I, honestly, there's the, the, the maximum we, respect to you, man, because I I don't put myself on a pedestal like that. Never wow. have. I'm just I'm just me, I, and you know. So I don't like I said I don't live for tomorrow. Tomorrow I could be bang gone mm. in an instant, no problem. I don't I don't fear what you know. I, I don't fear an end of life. I just know that there's going to be a, another chance for me yeah. to kind of 
even come back better. <laughs> and play. That's basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just do. That's basically, you know, I never understood. Um, when I did this gig once at Union Chapel with Zakir Hussain, I'm, I'm going to, it's weird, I've name dropped quite a bit. Yeah, no, please do, um, please do. Um, I did this gig and Zakir, I goes, I goes to him, I goes, you know, when you say that whatever you know is a drop in the ocean, what does that, where does that put me? He says, Johnny, he says, I don't just say a drop in the ocean. I say it takes more than one lifetime to learn doubler. And that's something on that. He goes, have you, have you been on YouTube and typed in kid doubler? This is Zaki telling me. And I said, no, he goes, just do it. Kid doubler, just do it. I honestly, when I did it, I was like, what the hell, man? Five-year-olds playing like how Zaki plays. You understand it takes more than one life. And that kid has bought that with him. He didn't learn that. He didn't learn it from, you know, being three and then to five. And he's playing like, have you have you done this before? Have you seen any of these? Yeah, there's a couple of um, Instagram accounts that I've seen a lot of young young kids playing like the way they've done all or they play the double eye especially. And like when you see that that time, it's like it's a it's it's God gifted, isn't it? In, in terms of that talent, to that's what they say, God gift. Yeah, yeah. even even from remembering any kind of uh, patterns or playing, it's you can okay. Let's just do that, but then to execute it and have perfection timing and to do everything from it. I mean, that's not my area of thing, but you can. I think what's definite is you can appreciate art when you see it. You may not know what oh. it is, but you know what it is. Wow. Oh, so oh, there you, off, no, no, Siri was talking there, but he was just showing a, a showing a clip of someone playing. Oh, yeah. Wow. That is crazy. So this kid here is probably around about five years old. About six, six, seven years old, and he's playing like that. I was just going, what the hell, man? That's unbelievable. And this was a while ago now, so... But it's just one reference video to, to kind of go... That's unbelievable. Do you see the next generation of the UK coming through like that? You've got world experience. Like you could just see that from your from your world passes, yeah? <laughs> you, you've, you're visiting different countries. Do you see in the UK the next generation? Because Oman Heya, I had on, on the podcast, he was asking me the very question he was saying... We're seeing the same people going around around a circle, but that next generation is really struggling to to come through. You'll get the little offshoots here, there, but there isn't that next gen of the love for the doll that I was talking about. Eight on my road, for example, and yeah, they, you know, doll was really, really fashionable at one stage, and then I know, and then now well, you know what it is, you know what it is. It's the parents that don't want them to pursue it because they know how hard it is. It's difficult, man. You know, getting into an industry where everyone's doing the same it's too it's too time consuming it's too hard you either do it full time or there's no part time in doing it if you do it part time you you're a part of a team you can't you can't do it full time and be part of a team yeah because what are you doing the rest of the time yeah, you're doing yeah. something during the week unless you've got a monday to friday job but then in the evenings, you're pumping all of your time into promoting what the Doll brand is about. And there's some teams out there, they've got the time and they've got the effort to do it. But there's only few and far between. I'm proud to say that I've played in countries. I'm probably the only Doll that would ever play in those countries again. I've played in Syria. Not many people can say that. Wow. And now... No one can play in Syria because it's a freaking war zone. I've not played in Ukraine, but I've played in Poland quite a few times. Mm. Um, I've played in Russia. You can't play there anymore. <laughs> not, yeah, well, there. Not, not yet. We'll, yeah. we'll save that for another sorry, podcast. I mentioned, those two, I mentioned yeah. those two because they are current yeah, at the yeah, moment. Yeah. You know, and sorry to put a timeline on this. What was, it, what was the... the did you ever have a moment where you're you're performing in a country and you're like, what the hell am I doing? How, how did it get to here? <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah, a couple. A couple. There was like, 
it was it was one show that I did and it was in Japan right <laughs> but basically it was like a theater show we did in Japan on our tour and the theater it was quite interesting but everyone turned up and they were like suddenly they start eating everyone starts eating in the audience and I'm going this is so weird like I'm playing here and people are eating and then in between numbers they put their sandwich down and, and, and then pick up and carry. The, the etiquette is just is just to be so polite I was like what the hell only at the end I worked out that the theater was so popular with tourists people that came to that place were all on holiday Mm. And they were all a part of a tourist group. So they're watching the show, but they're having their lunch at the same time. <laughs> it's so funny. It was just, and that was one moment I was like, what the hell am I doing? No one was dancing. No one was like, and there I am jumping around and saying, no. like, going, yeah, yeah, great. But we're not going to dance. Do you, see, do, you, like, do you get a different, um, like a cultured view in terms of that? When you hear a door, then and the, the, the natural thing is to start getting up, but you've got that rhythm in your DNA, it's intrinsically built into kind of Punjabi culture in some way that the, the, the beat. Do you ever see people uh, appreciating that in a different way? You know, you've just said somebody just clapping. Was there, is there anybody who else is similar to just get that? Worse. Get it up and start dancing? Oh, worse. Worse. oh God. Yeah, yeah, I've had the Tom, I've had the Tom Jones effect. What What's that? Just like start singing Delilah halfway through or? No, no. Where they take the yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> I, was, I was trying to go more. P- yeah, P- I wasn't quite sure what to make out of it first, but I've done, I've done like gigs in, and they've just gone like top, topless. Wow, <laughs> it's quite funny. We just look at each other like with this is with the Door Foundation. Oh, me and the boys just look at each other. And go, <laughs> keep, <laughs> keep, that's like keep that's looking like, at the door, lads. What is this turning into? Once we'd done a gig in Prague, this bundar came on stage. He started taking his clothes off. When he got down to his boxes, I was like, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> like my wife, like. And ki- my wife and kids were there at this show, at this big festival. He started, he got down to his, like, I was like, uh, can you get him off the stage, please? Like right now. Afterwards, yeah. I found out he was like one of the main uh, funders of the festival. <laughs> like, yeah, but listen. Get it back on. You're not going to do that. Do it in some other band set. Are you doing it in hours? No, get off. Like, get, it back, was... get it back on. You can do that. Book us next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, but, you know, I, I mean, pe- okay, so, playing Dawn, everyone, they've played Dawn. Mm. They played it in unison. They played it as an ensemble. Great, no problem. When I was starting out, that was a new thing. So I started doing that with my team, playing as an ensemble, and it was it was a good thing. It came it came about, and it was something that it wasn't two people anymore. It was more. It was like you know, ten, fifteen, twenty. It was more. There was, a, I can probably count about three, maybe four times that this has happened to me. And it's almost like an outer body experience. Now I have this ability. I don't know if it's a talent. I don't know if it's a sin or I don't know if it's a blessing. It's probably a bit of both. It's on the cusp of a sin, uh, sorry, not a sin, a blessing and probably you know something that's how can I put it okay so I have this ability when when someone's playing doll um for me and they playing whatever sometimes it happens when someone's speaking as well um what my brain does is it records it and slows it down and plays it back to me and I hear it all in slow motion again I hear it again in slow motion. Um, When this happens, I get to I get to actually pinpoint where people make mistakes, even if they're playing fast. And I just kind of go, you know, this bit, it's not quite right. You need to fix that or whatever. 
on stage when we're playing in unison, there's probably about three or four times that we've been so, the surt has been so on it, I've closed my eyes and I hear the gaps in between the Nas as we're playing. Like it, it might be playing a straight chant. I can hear the gaps in between. That's how locked in we are, like bang, mm. like that. At that point, something happens and it's that hair raising moment, but it's beyond that as well. It You get so involved and you're so in tune with what you're playing. It's almost to the point you become beyond your your own instrument you know i've always i've always believed that once your sweat and your blood is dripped on your drum it becomes a part of your dna becomes a part of you to the point it's like you know the respect for for your instrument has to be the highest level because that's what's putting them bread in your mouth at the end of the day which is why i always say listen you know if you want to drink, sure, I'll do it after. Just give you give your instrument respect first, you know. Just do that because that's feeding you at the end of the day. But people don't see that. They don't. They don't see that side of it. And why, why do you, why do you think that's a sin then? I don't think sin's the right word. It's probably um, I, I don't know the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, it's a blessing, and it's. What's the opposite to a blessing? I, w- I would I would say it's sin, but I, I get what you mean in terms of like from a teacher's point of view, it's actually an asset in terms of where you're able to kind of teach. Yeah, the next that part is an it. asset. But sometimes yeah. I, I hate it because, you know, it's like something that I don't want. I don't the want the to perfectionist. Be to is that the perfectionist, the control bit in terms of the creative side that starts to take over what you say? When it happens, I can't talk. I have to listen to it. Sometimes it happens. One time it happened, <laughs> this, I got introduced to this a director of this festival. She was so hot. But when she spoke, I replayed it back in slow motion in my head. I couldn't answer. I was like, I'm listening to what she's just saying. I'm just looking at her and she's going, are you okay? And I'm going, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. But I'm actually <laughs> re- rewind and replaying it back. It wasn't a case of like I was you know, flawed by her beauty or anything. It wasn't, it wasn't even that. It was just like, I'm listening to you, but I, I, I can't talk at the moment. We're, we're not I'm having talking. much luck with our analogies today, are we? <laughs> no. no, definitely not. Anyway, <laughs> so ultimately, um, it gets to the point where you, you, con- you get consumed by your own instrument to the point that it, it becomes a part of you. It becomes, it becomes it's human nature second nature to you to actually play the instrument know where your knife is like placement placement is everything where you actually how you strike the drum so that the drum will sing for you as opposed to making an effort and hitting it harder to try and make the sound no there's certain things that you do to the drum before you even start playing so it will sing Mm. there's certain things that you know drums need nurturing they need love they need love they need maintenance they need care people don't have that time anymore they just don't care anymore you know now there's people that make a living out of fixing other people's doors and go here there you go but they don't you know the, then people take the drum and they don't look after it again and then give it back then it goes back around you. here I've, I've damaged it again here can you fix it so they do that. I'm just kind of. I know you're pressed for time, and so I want to bring it bring it back around full circle because yeah. we we will pick this up again in the future at some point. A hundred percent, it will. Um, yeah. This this is called the bandwagon. So uh, <laughs> I, um, I I give an opportunity to each of each of my guests to either jump on a bandwagon or jump off a bandwagon, or just generally have an opportunity just to clear anything off their chest or anything that they want to say. So. This is your opportunity if there's anything that you wanted to kind of raise up or jump on or off. About what? Any, oh, it could uh, be anything. About music or? Uh, it could be absolutely anything. Amazing. Um, I think, I think 
and there's been a lot of criticism as well about this in the past, um, the Asian media, the Asian press, should actually get more involved in their own stuff, what they're doing, not music that's coming from India, because now it's all coming from India now. Mm. You know, they're like a conveyor belt. You know, <laughs> it's just there's so much talent out there, which is amazing. But there's so much talent here, which is not getting exposed. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking mm. about new talent, like, you know, these youngsters that are coming up. Yeah, great. You know, you want to expose people, but, you know, it's always, there's always a window. There's always a window. What I mean by that is basically artists, they come and they get milked, completely milked, and they know that their time is between oh. here and here. Mm -hmm. They're going to get milked in that time. So what they do is they spread themselves really thin to monopolize and just take it wherever they can, however it comes. I think that's wrong. I think if you buy a packet of M&Ms, you want to eat like one a day because the packet will last a lot longer. Mm. That's an analogy, by the way. <laughs> no, that was a, that's the best one today. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. can I can relate to that. Yeah, so, exactly. But in terms of like, you start, you know, from like, you just raised a really good point from, the, and, a, and a few people have said that about investing in the UK and market. I think from radio and things like that, they, they're kind of like um, held to account by the listeners. They listen to all the latest, it, it, like a lot of the new music that's come out very rarely uses in uh, Punjab or Indian instruments at all. It's all kind of like drill beats and stuff from there. So that's a challenge. Kind of like independent news media is kind of like everyone now has got the power of a phone or be able to do this. And I think that can help independent people come, you know, push it. They won't need the mainstream media that was once needed before. You you can you can do that. I think those are the elements in time to kind of showcase it. Because like that five-year-old boy that you just said, in what other time would they have been able to get picked up? But it's on YouTube. So I, I do think that we're that that next generation on the cusp is there. And yeah. what, what I would say is that those people who have already got the platform should do a lot more in terms of giving the next gen a chance. So just how you gave me a chance, for example, back in them that all coming on here, you know, you know, you should be, you know, people should be kind of getting your stories out and getting these documented down. And, and this is one of the reasons why I want to do these podcasts, because there's always people and things I want, uh, are, you know, uh, topics that I was always interested in. Yeah. And, and I think given the, that that next generation of chances and they become, I, I've got, a, I'm more positive than I once was, you know, because I, 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 it actually starts, it's, I'm actually pissed off now when you, where you've gone to do that big show and there's nobody there. And that was one of the biggest scenes and you just know the impact in terms of what that could have done. But at the same time, that might have needed to happen for everybody to learn to listen to hear a story like this, not just on here, but on It changed else. my mindset though. Yeah. It changed my mindset. And I just thought, you know what? Don't rely on no one. Mm. Don't trust anyone to turn up when you've left tickets. I bent over backwards to try and get them Led Zeppelin tickets for press, only to embarrass myself. It was horrible. And that feeling of, oh, didn't, didn't anyone come from the Asian? I was like, no one turned up. And that, like, that feeling will never leave me because no one came. No one came to see that. They would have seen an incredible show and been able to maybe interview Robert should've, and Jimmy. You should have you told know? him that they were, you should have told him he was from West Brom anyway, Robert but, Plant. Yeah, and he then, is. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then it would have been, uh, you would have said like he's Desi. <laughs> no, but it, it's no, crazy. But... It re really is crazy, you know. And, you know, this unity thing I uh, and this segregation thing is the segregation that I, I hate the unity thing is something that I actually promote. I want the unity. I want people to actually, you know, promote the instrument, promote our culture, stay within, you know, our culture, not leave it behind and, and experiment, do it because, you know, that's the only way forward. And if the folk police come after you, like they did for me, show them the middle finger and just go, this is, this is what I want to do. Sorry. I don't play traditional beats, sorry. But 
It's not about that. Mm. I'm still exposing the instrument to corners of the world that people haven't been and never will. We're the first all group to play in Westminster Abbey. That was funny. Um, we did a rehearsal the night before we actually did the, the gig. And the, there was a, one of the priests that, there. And he, quite a tall man, he leaned down, kneeled down at me and he goes, Johnny, I think you've woken up some really old kings and queens. And I went to him, I went, yeah, but I think they liked it. <laughs> he goes, so do I. <laughs> On that note, um, I'd like to just thank you, Johnny. I really appreciate you taking your time out of a busy schedule um, you. and, you know, making time for me. And, um, you know, it's something that will live with me for, for a long time. But I appreciate it. I'm definitely getting you back on there. But thank you very much, mate. No worries, man. There's so much more that you don't even know. But thank you. Thanks for your time. No problem.